Welcome to Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. What if you could learn from experienced real estate investors, find out what got them to where they are now, get insight into their daily habits, and take these insights to inspire your own growth? Each week, Jonathan Green shares an in-depth look at the mindful approach to real estate investing. Jonathan is a real estate investor, advisor, and coach, as well as the founder of Streamlined Properties and the team leader of Streamlined Properties on Market, brokered by eXp Realty. Whether you are looking to start from scratch, get to the next level, or just a straightforward and honest approach to real estate investing, Jonathan seeks to provide a free mentorship program you can take with you anywhere. Now, here's Jonathan. Welcome back to another week of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. I appreciate you being here. As always, I'm going to give you a couple reminders before we get going. Without you, we never would have got to two episodes a week. So that's all because of you. And now where we could use some help is in our five-star reviews and our subscribers, wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it be Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whatever, subscribe. Make sure you're checking out our 10-minute clips on YouTube. Let's get to it. My guest this week is Chris Miles, the anti-financial advisor. He's going to talk to you about how to create money ripples with real estate. This is an interesting one. You better buckle up. Let's go. This is episode 78 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with my guest, Chris Miles, the anti-financial advisor. Chris is a cash flow expert, and his company, Money Ripples, specializes in getting his clients fast financial results. We're going to talk all about it. Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, man, I'm so excited to be here today. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you. I'm going to start in a couple areas that I know that you've talked about, but I want to get your take on them right away. Why does mainstream financial advice suck? Because I agree with this, but I want to see if we're talking about the same things. Well, let me ask you this. I mean, if you saw a restaurant that you're considering going to eat at, and you saw that there's 100 reviews and only one of them gave a five-star review, (laughs) you'd probably wonder, should I ever eat here, right? And that's pretty much the success rate of financial advising. You know, for example, if you look at Fidelity, Fidelity came out with their numbers. They have 45 million Americans that use their 401ks and IRAs. And of that 45 million, only 750,000 or about one and a half percent have at least a million dollars. And the funny thing is, well, I wouldn't say it's funny. It's pretty sad. But the sad thing is of those people that have at least a million dollars in their accounts, there was another survey done that over 35 percent of them think it'll be a miracle for them to be able to retire. And that's right there. That's the big issue we have, right? Is that really less than 1% of people think, well, maybe it won't be a miracle that I can retire. <laughs> right, so right. it's like that one five-star review. Yeah. Do you, do you think it's that, uh, you know, safe, safe money spot, you know, that makes people feel better and they don't understand about educated risk? Oh, absolutely not. It's, it's high risk, mediocre returns, right? And, and, you know, it really hit home for me personally with my own family, with my own dad, for example, because he was kind of the inspiration for me to start as financial advisor. Now, granted, he was working in the automotive industry. It wasn't like he was a financial genius, but he was like the guy that Dave Ramsey would look up to. You know, he was the guy that saved everything. He paid off his debt early, you know, that kind of guy. And, And what was interesting is he always taught me to be cheap and to save every penny you got. Well, when I was a financial advisor and I said to take that, take that path, I remember he said, well, when are you going to advise me? And so I sat down with him. He says, Chris, I'm 61 years old. I want to retire at some point. What do I need to do? And when I saw his, you know, the fact he paid off his house in 18 years, so he was totally debt free. He had saved up and crammed the money in his 401k, getting the match and everything that they tell you is supposed to be the best strategy ever. The problem was is that I said, dad, based on your, your numbers right here, if you want to retire today, you better hope you die in five years because mm. that's how long it's going to be before you run out of money. Now, remember, he's like, well, Chris, what do I do then? Like, what else can I do? I said, I don't know. You did everything right. You did everything that I would recommend and maybe even better. And still, it's not enough. Yeah. And that bothered me. It bothered me a lot because, you know, my part of my inspiration for becoming a financial advisor is because I would always hear my dad say, besides things like, we can't afford this. Money doesn't grow in trees. We think I am made of money. You know, those kind of phrases growing up. But then he also would say things like, this work, this job is going to kill me, right? Like, I will die working. 
And I wanted to give him his life back. And here I am in this dilemma, realizing that although he followed it to a T, it wasn't enough. And I realized it wasn't just him. It was all of my clients when I really looked at it closely. And then, of course, even looked at financial advisors. There's guys working in my office since the late 1970s. They couldn't retire either. So why would I keep teaching this? Yeah. And then where did real estate eventually come into the equation? Because I know, at least with my experience, I've had a lot of financial advisors who know that like all I do is invest in real estate. And they're like, well, you should you have too many properties. And I'm like, well, this, I know that better because they, mm -hmm. they want to keep the money in the in the pool. But I like yeah. to take the money out of the pool. So where did you figure out that real estate comes into it? And, and where did you get your interest in that part? Oh, yeah, I was brainwashed with all the other financial advisors saying that real estate was sucked, right? Like it doesn't pay enough. You know, it I've only keeps that, up yeah. inflation at 3% a year. That's all it appreciates. Where look at the stock market. It's done 10 or 12% a year since 2000 BC when the Egyptians ruled the <laughs> earth, right? You know, things like that. And it's funny because with my dad's experience that I had, that was the end of 2005. It's like when the student's ready, the teacher appears. And right then... I remember a, a few weeks later, I called up one of my friends who I hired to be a financial advisor, but then he left to go do real estate investing. And mm. I called him up and I'm thinking he's going to be broke, but I get the opposite reaction from him. Instead, he starts saying things like, man, like Chris, life is amazing. My dad and I, we've partnered on some deals. We've now doubled his income as a professor at the local university. And I said, hold on, you guys only been partnered together for four months. That's too good to be true, quote unquote, right? Yeah. He's like, and, and finally, that's where he stopped me. He says, well, how many clients are financially free? None. Good job. How many of you guys, a financial advisor, are financially free, right? Those critical questions is what got me to wake up. And I said, all right, I'm willing to listen. He's like, no, you're not. You just got done argue with me that stocks are better than real estate. I said, listen, I'm open. Like, give me something here. And so that's where yeah. he had me read a lesser known rich dad, poor dad book called Who Took My Money? which is about why mutual funds are horrible. And then he had me listen to this radio show that these two real estate investors did. It was an AM talk radio show at the time because podcasts weren't quite cool then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and over those course of those few months, it got me to the point where I had this integrity crisis, right? It wasn't an identity crisis as much as an integrity crisis because once I started to realize in the real estate world that it wasn't about accumulating money like financial advisors have you do where you try to live on less than the interest, it's about creating passive income, like real cash flow. And when I realized that someone could have the same amount of money and make it work better for them, you know, for example, in the financial world, if you have a million dollars, you're only supposed to pull out no more than 3%. 4% rule, that thing is such a bad myth that people have already debunked so many times. That was from 1976, by the way, when they came up with that rule, <laughs> not yeah. 2023. So 3% is the most you should take out. Well, think of it. If you have a million dollars living on 3%, that's 30,000 a year. But then when I realized, I'm like, wait a minute, these guys, I think even do hard money lending or whatever. And let's, let's just say they get paid 1% a month, 12% a year. Well, that same million dollars doesn't make them 30,000 a year. It makes them 120,000 or $10,000 a month, you right? Very different lifestyle, very different potential. And already a guy who was starting to question if mutual funds was the answer this all of a sudden became the answer for me. And that's where the integrity crisis came in. I said, I can either keep being a financial advisor, yeah. put the blinders on and keep doing what I'm doing or leave. And so I chose the latter. I left. I said, I'll never teach about money again. I'm done. I'll just do mortgages. You know, I'll be a mortgage broker because in 2006, everybody could be a mortgage broker. <laughs> <laughs> and See I'll what happened there. Dancing yeah. on the side, you know, and, yeah. and that's what I did and, until I got to the point where later that year, after getting my own streams of income going, I was able to be financially independent when I was 28, almost 29 years old. Yeah. And one thing you said, a cash flow plus passive income. And to me, that's what creates wealth. A lot of people think of wealth as it's sitting in a bank, but like, come on, the money is not even there and real estate's tangible. So mm -hmm. to me, like the draw, I don't know if you found this along the way, but like I grew up with my dad teaching me all about real estate. We we're going to properties as a kid. And I always saw the tangibility of it. Like, oh, that is a house. Like you own the house, you own the land, as opposed to all of these other, you know, quote, assets that earn you money slowly. You can't really, you just, well, it's like a piece of paper or now like you just look in your E-Trade account. It, it, it doesn't have the same type of thing. Like I feel like it's just a, a different type of asset class. When did you get to that yeah. realization? Like of seeing it like, wow, okay, I actually own something that I can see instead of like trading, you know, future options or, you know, papers. You know, sadly, I probably didn't get the full gravity of that until after the last recession. 
<laughs> um, yeah, after yeah. I went from financial independence to get my butt kicked and then realizing that I was trying to gamble on paper a lot, you know, and, and that can even be in real estate too, to some degree, yeah, you know, if you're not for careful. Sure. But like, for example, I, I, I packed a ton of money into the equity of my house because even though I was starting to realize Dave Ramsey was full of crap, you know, I still was thinking, well, you know, I'm a mortgage broker. I can pull out equity whenever I want because in the conditions of 2006, 2000, early 2007, anybody could pull out cash yeah. whenever they wanted to. So I figured just throw the equity into my house, save the interest. If I ever needed it, I can just get a cash out refi, right? Then, of course, latter end of 2007, in fact, it was right after I renovated my house, got to depreciate even more than it cost me to renovate it. So I thought I was a genius, right? Because <laughs> appreciation happened over the course of like four months. Well, I try to get the cash out of it. And then the banks say, oh, you better raise your credit score. And then after I did that, they said, oh, you know what? You, we need this, you to cross through these jump, different hoops. We just changed the rules last week. And then when we got to September 07, they said, sorry, we don't do any more cash out refis. And I watched all the equity not just get trapped in my property, but then disappear. Yeah. And, and so even though that was a, a real estate property, right? It, ha it had tangible asset. I realized that, you know, it's good to have assets, especially if they can appreciate, but never ever bank on appreciation, right? It's always about the profit and the cash flow. You know, what's the act? Is it really an asset where it pays you income, like you hear about in Rich Dad Poor Dad? That became very apparent to me. And so when I did real estate the next time around, instead of trying to focus on transactional real estate as much, like flipping and things like that, I went more to like long term rentals. You know, I went to that game or I started doing things where if I lend money, I made sure I was on title, you know, like I had yeah. asset backing up much like the bank. And I started to realize, you know, that the over ambition and gambling of my 20s caught up to me in my 30s. So that by the time I hit 39, I was able to be financially independent again. I was a very different investor by that point because I was very overly what some people might think is overly conservative. I mean, normal Americans would say, oh, you seem risky because you're doing right, real yeah, estate. Yeah. But, no, that, but that's risk. balanced against, 401k. <laughs> right, you're balancing it against that 401k, easy stuff that just sits there and doesn't really, you know, do a lot over time. Yeah, it, yeah. that makes sense. But when, when you were when you were young, before you got into financial advising, were you interested in real estate growing up? Was it something that you saw as a, a like an asset? Not well, I mean, I knew about it, but I really didn't understand it. Yeah, it was it was a very foreign thing to me because my dad, he just owned his house. You know, he was the very traditional saver, right? So, yeah. I mean, even when I was in high school, I mean, when we talked about investing, I was brainwashed like everybody else was, which was that usually means stocks. So I remember in the, you know, in the mid nineties, my friend and I were comp you know, competing against each other to see who does better with his Microsoft stock. Cause we we're in the Pacific Northwest versus yeah. Starbucks. Cause again, Pacific Northwest and Starbucks is just an up and coming company then. And we're like comparing to see who's going to win out. Right. That kind of stuff was like the way I viewed investing. You know, and, and even even business, it wasn't until later when I became a business owner, I realized, oh, this could be business. It could yeah. be real estate. But the thing that blew my mind, like in 2006, when I got away from financial advising into real estate investing, is that it wasn't just having a rental property, right? There was so much more possible than that. The fact that you could become the bank, you could lend money to other investors, make money off that. The fact that you could pool your money together and buy into an apartment complex, which you know, when you think about it from a simple kid, you know, even young adult standpoint, you think, oh, I don't have enough money to buy an apartment. That's not even, that's not even a realm of possibility. So blinders, right? Once yeah. those blinders are taken off, that's why I was so freaking excited. I hadn't made a single penny of passive income for the first few months, but I was just excited because I saw all of these options open up that I never thought possible. You know, that's, that's the amazing thing about real estate is that it's so much bigger and, and there's so much bigger variety and diversity in it than what people say. You can literally be pretty well diversified focusing on real estate investments. I agree 100%. I've said it a lot. I love diversification across assets. Like I still do invest in stocks, but I'm not mm -hmm. like like just putting everything in stocks because I really do look at real estate as that you can have a short-term rental, you can have a commercial property, you can go right. mixed use, you can buy a multifamily, you can get apartment buildings. I mean, you can invest in elder care. There's so many things that are bottomed out, triple net leases, like it's all real estate. Yeah. And I don't think that people understand that. I really agree with what you said. I, I And I have said it. It's just that diversification across assets is available just inside real estate. And financial advisors, you know this. They've I've heard it so many times since I was a kid. You know, 
like, hey, you can't be too, that's too much in real estate. And I'm like, but, uh-huh. you know, some of these are short term rentals. Like, I, I, I know what I'm doing. Like, I've never lost in real estate and then I lose in stocks. And they're like, well, we'll, we'll gain it back next year. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, I want to gain it. I don't want to lose. You know, I don't, I want to at least lose on my own terms, I guess. Yeah. You know, you, you brought up a good memory of mine that I learned from a brother in law that he came from a family that was wealthy or be, had become wealthy. So he's like second generation wealth. And I remember I, I, I finally got the courage and, the, and really the hubris, right, to be able to sit down with him and say, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to actually get this guy to become my client. Because if I can get in with him, I get in with the rest of the family, oh, man, I'm set for life as a financial advisor. So I sat down with him, gave him my nice presentation, wore my best suit, made sure it was dry, clean, and pressed beforehand. <laughs> I brought the best guy from my office to back me up because, you know, by the mouth of, of two or three witnesses shall ever be established, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm going in with all my big guns. And after I get done with my presentation, my brother-in-law says, all right, so let me get this straight. I give you 10 grand just to play with today. You're saying you can make me 12% a year. Is that right? I said, well, I can't make any guarantees because past performance design is not indicative of future results, as you've always seen the disclaimer, right? Mm-hmm. But that's what the market's done, which, by the way, it never has. The S&P 500 has averaged just under 8% for the last 30 years as a real rate of return. And 90% yeah. plus of mutual funds never even get S&P 500 returns. That means... Most of them are earning you less than seven and a half percent a year, you know? Yeah. So anyways, so I said, yeah, but 12%. Well, he's like, well, that's 1200 bucks a year. But Chris, I could take that same 10 grand, invest in my business. And his business was about, they, were, they came from an automotive business sense of buying and selling cars. And so he yeah. had semi trucks that he was selling in his, in his uh, lot. He's like, I could put a $10,000 down payment on a semi truck, turn around, sell it a few months later and make a $20,000 profit. <laughs> So Chris, why would I, why would I invest with you? And of course, the first thing out of my trained financial advisor mouth was, well, you should be diversified. You should pull your eggs in that one basket. And he just said, thanks for your time. Thanks. And that was it. I've I've said that many times. Yeah. (laughs) It's fair though. I mean, I think it's really cool that you've done the whole cycle because financial advisors, I guess the training is like no real estate, right? Because you can't, they can't get paid off of the real estate proceeds you know and that that's it but it's like we all know the game i mean i'm thinking about it all the time and then your money's locked in it's like well you can't take all of the stuff out of index funds like you're gonna get a penalty and then you have cap gains and it's like why, why did why did i do this well what was your first real estate investment on your own my first one was actually taking my starter home i mean you could say my starter home was the first one but that that's not where i ended there I, after a few years after i started to you know, get to the point where i was financially independent I decided to take my starter home, sell it to an investor at full retail, lease it back so I could basically strip the equity out of it, you know, full yeah. appraised value, and then turn around and sublease it. And so I turned around and subleased it. A little arbitrage, yeah. It basically, yeah. I wanted to get the equity out and still have a, an asset, a rental, right? And, you know, when the recession hit, it didn't exactly work out, but I thought I was pretty creative and pretty smart for doing that. <laughs> but yeah, you know, like that was, uh, I mean, that was my first deal. I, I was like, I didn't even think that was even a possibility, but it was like, well, how can I get everything that I want? Real estate really helps you do that. It helps you realize, how can I get everything I want? And maybe even how do I incentivize other people, create a win-win So what they wanted? Because the person that I sold it to, they wanted, as an investor, they said, if I can use my credit and essentially put little to no money down, because back then you could, yeah, that's amazing. Because then I can make money off of just using my credit. And I would pay them just above their mortgage payment so they'd make a profit off that. It's almost like an infinite rate of return if you put zero down payment on that property. And so that was my very first deal. And I helped several other people do the same thing at that time. Yeah, I mean, you've identified what I think is the thing that's underknown in the real estate investing world. It is that the the way to get deals is by figuring out what the win is for both sides. So both people are happy. When you're struggling the whole time to get a deal done, nobody's happy at closing. You know, and most people need, something they don't need the cash they need to get somewhere or someone has to solve a problem pre-foreclosure and i think that's what's missing in all the shiny objects that are out there it's like if you just focus on how to create something where both sides win because i was about to ask you like hey well what was in it for them you know Mm -hmm. to buy that let you sublease it and it's like oh you you just explained it like that's the way to park their money smartly and adjust around so yeah, yeah i mean that's why creative finances is is so popular now but you really have to understand how to do it to do it right. 
That's exactly it. It's it's true. And I, I'm very grateful that at least I learned that one principle before I kind of jumped in investing because of those guys that did that radio show, they were always pounding in the principle, dollars follow value, right? Dollars follow the value you create for other people. And so instead of in my scarcity brain as a financial advisor, I used to think it was always a, a zero sum game. It was a win lose transaction. Someone had to win and someone had to lose. Therefore, if I'm a benevolent person as a financial advisor, I'm going to try to do whatever I can to lose on that transaction so that my clients win. But if I ever want to win financially, I have to somehow get my clients to lose, right? And that was my (laughs) belief system. And then when they said, no, it's about how do you create the win-win? How does everybody get what they want? And I started to see that creativity and how that worked. I said, oh my goodness. And, And that didn't only just work in real estate. That even worked in my mortgage business because pretty soon... You know, I'm, I'm starting to, you know, show people like, hey, here's how you can cash out equity and use it to invest. And that became kind of my forte. And, and I didn't like doing paperwork. So, you know, one of my friends gave me the idea. He said, listen, you know, this is something we could do in real estate, but you can do this in business too. Why don't you farm out the paperwork to somebody else? Instead of you trying to take 100% of that, that transaction, share it with somebody else and take 50%. And I did that. And so I was spending a half hour or so educating people about their mortgage, what they could do with the equity. And then I would turn them over to Clark and then Clark would do all the work. And then I get a check in the mail a month or two later for all the, you know, for us splitting the commissions on the mortgage you know, deal. And my, my life became so much easier because I was always about how to solve problems, add value, serve people. And I made more money during that period of time. And of course, since then, but more money then than I ever did as a financial advisor, believing I just had to screw people over. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I want to talk to you about passive income and then cash flow, because I know cash flow is such an important part. So passive income is interesting. And I think the way that you're explaining it it is not like I think of passive income. Most people think of it as sitting on the beach and earning money. But Mm -hmm. I don't think that's the way you're explaining it. You're explaining it is money coming in where you could be sitting on the beach. But I always like to say a lot of real estate investing isn't as actual passive as people think. The money is but if you buy an eight eight unit building and manage it yourself, that part's not as passive not as passive. people think. Yeah. So, like, what when you think passive income, how do you think of it? And especially with your clients, like, what are you calling passive income to them so that it that it's closer to passive? Yeah, like you said, the aplex that you manage, uh, your CPA would say based on the tax rules that's passive income because the IRS right. classifies it as <laughs> that's, that. That's exactly what I mean. Yeah. Right. But yeah, when I see passive now, the things I did early on was not passive. That was very active. Even though, like you said, you could get it going and then pretty much, I wouldn't say set and forget it, but you can have it more, less managed down the road. That's true. But I wouldn't put that in the passive category. Like people that are wholesalers, flippers. Definitely not anything but oh, passive. Gosh. They are the, transactional. The, 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 the opposite. <laughs> yeah. The opposite of passive, exactly. Yeah. So when I think of passive, or I tell my clients passive now, I really mean it. Not the marketing BS you see out there today. It really is like, for example, even if I buy a rental, like a long-term rental, I'm buying it as a turnkey property that I buy through a turnkey company that yeah. they go and find me the pro- help me find the property. I just have to buy it. And then somebody else, usually the turnkey prop company will properly manage it for me, right? That's how I see, that's, that's probably the least passive strategy that I would consider passive income. Because even then you gotta manage the property manager. If they don't do their job, then exactly you feel like you have another part-time job again, right? So you gotta be careful. Yeah. But, but I mean, I have properties that I've spent probably less than an hour in the last four or five years on, you know, because they just keep paying checks, the property manager does their job. On the flip side, you know, like other things would be like lending money where you lend to other investors and let them pay you. That's passive, right? Yeah. Uh, even though if I do syndications, hey, if there's an operator doing all the work, great. Now, there is a, d- a degree of separation from the investment. And you got to be careful and you got to really make sure you do good due diligence on that operator. But that to me can be passive. Funds, you know, I, I, there's a company like I advertise in my podcast that, you know, they, they do accredited and non-accredited money and they have a fund where they lend to like 350 different investors plus have apartments and other things diversifying that fund. That's a great example. Like you diversified, you can put your money in, you do nothing, right? Even I have a partnership, even right now, I have a business partnership with Raw Land where, I mean, literally I'm a 70% partner, but I'm all financing it. The 30% yeah. partner is doing all the work, right? I'm letting them do the work. I have, you know, the bulk of the profits and right there, very passive, you know, I can watch it and it's a partnership. So I have a little bit more control than I would if I'm just in a, a syndication as like a, more of a passive partner, you know, so, or a yeah. limited partner. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with all of that. I've really, I really, I never looked at syndications because I grew up. My dad was a cash investor, and I, I want, I wanted to be active. And now I'm like, I'm old. I don't really, you know, flipping's annoying to me now. Like, I really <laughs> like the end product, but everything in the middle is like, I just don't want to do. But yeah, I mm-hmm, really that. think that syndications. You made a great point. Syndications, I think, are the most passive. But like, you have to understand, like that you have no control. So you better Mm -hmm. be sure, you know, on your GPs and the due diligence aspect. And now I'm now I'm interested, though, at this age, like I'm starting to say, like, I know the operators. So it's much easier for me to to invest in syndications because I've done the, the due diligence. Hey, it's Jonathan. This is just a brief interlude to talk to you about Deal Machine. Listen, I've used Deal Machine and I was crushing it with my Concerned Citizen postcard on Deal Machine. You can look that video up on my YouTube and find out how I did it. It works. Deal Machine works. I've had David Lecko, the CEO, on the podcast. So if you want a free trial of Deal Machine, the elite driving for dollars app, and I'm telling you, it works if you use it correctly, you can go to my link at bit.ly slash Zen Deal Machine. Now, bit.ly is B-I-T dot L-Y slash Zen Deal Machine. It's free and you'll be up and running in two minutes and then you can figure out if you want to keep it. Let's get back to the show. Now we'll take that where, you know, we talk about passive income. We understand what that means. I think you described it like perfectly. People are going to get a great idea of the difference between the the coin phrase of what's considered passive income for taxes and what's actually passive. Let's talk cash flow, because I always used to say, like, I'm not I didn't have to be focused on cash, fortunately, because I had enough cash to invest. And I was I was kind of more of an appreciation investor. I lived in a lot of houses. And then I just picked neighborhoods, right? I'd leave in three years, double my money. I was good at that. But then I started to think like, well, I mean, it's cool when the tenants pay also. So how are you maximizing cash flow for your clients? And what assets do you think are the best cash flow assets in real estate? Great question. So yeah, when I, and again, defining cash flow, because some people define cash flow as like revenue, right? Any right, money they right. earn in income. To me, cash flow is more like the Kiyosaki, rich dad, poor dad definition, which is, you know, Incomes here, expenses are here. The difference in between the profit is cash, positive I, cash flow. I agree completely. It's the opposite agree. It's negative cash flow. You don't want that. That's what happened to me eventually with that that first starter home that I did. It became a negative cash flow rental, and that wasn't good. Yeah. So yeah, when when we look at cash flow, we look at both sides of the equation because at the end of the day, all you can do is either increase income or reduce expenses, right? But we're not the kind of people that say live on rice and beans, you know, as like our good old friend Dave Ramsey says, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm more about how you can still love your life, enjoy it, have quality of life, but still be a wise steward of your money, right? Everything's about stewardship and what we teach, how to be a wise steward of your resources, your money, your time and everything. So, for example, one of the first things we look at is even their household income and expenses, right? What's coming in, what's going out, what's happening there? Because ultimately, if you want to get financially free faster, the thing is, you got to get your passive income above your monthly expenses. Yeah. So are there things where you're wasting money on your expense side that maybe isn't good for you? Maybe it's not serving you. Uh, one client, she had like $5 million between stocks and mutual funds. They wanted to be able to retire. And uh, they said, well, what can we do with real estate? And that's what they hired us for. But when we started looking at their stuff one-on-one, we said, you know what? Looking at some of these loans that you have, we could actually consolidate, pay off some of these loans free up almost $4,000 a month. And that, I mean, takes your expenses from 22,000 a month down to 18,000. That just makes it easier to hit your number. So that was the first step we did. Did that with almost no money out of pocket. And then we could take the rest and invest it to get them out of the rat race faster, you know? Uh, So we look at that. So we analyze that piece of it. It could be reducing taxes, especially if you're a business owner. Any business owner pretty much overpays taxes in some way or shape or form. It could just be getting them to watch their money more carefully. Most of our people though, they're usually Dave Ramsey poster children. <laughs> they yeah. usually come to us because they did everything Dave Ramsey said and they said, well, this <laughs> didn't, didn't work. work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're like, I'm debt free, but I'm not financially free. What's going on here? You know, that's, those people are usually the people that come to us. So we don't, it's not like people are like big spenders when we, d- we deal with them. But again, everybody has money leaks to some form. Then from there, then we look at the investment side, right? What can we do to get your money out of prison? and then get it out to invest in these alternative investments. 
getting out of prison usually is one of two places primarily. It's either equity and properties and or money locked away in stupid 401ks and IRAs and things like that. Pretty much anything a financial advisor tells you to do is lock your money in prison, right? They tell you to pay off yeah. your house early to pay those extra payments on it, even though you can never get that equity back. Like what happened to me in the last recession that really made it harder for me in the last recession. You know, those kind of things, right? Or lock them up in 401ks and IRAs. But if you want to touch before you're 59 and a half, you get slapped at 10% penalties for touching your own money. It's like yeah. asking mom and dad for the car keys to the car you bought. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. And so we try to get that money out. Yeah, I will say I, I was a little bit more free before 2008. And then when 2008 happened, I just like freaked out. I like, you know, I had I had two big properties that I, I lost money on, but I it, it was fine. You know, I had it manage risk against a bunch of other properties, but I got scared in 2008. And I just like was like, I didn't do anything. So I held the money just like sitting in the bank for a long time. And then when I was done with that, I was like, well, now I really don't want to lose money, even though I was steadily investing, I just wasn't going crazy. So then I just put it all in index funds. And that's boring. Yeah. You know, because like the economy can scare you into thinking these things aren't going to work out. But I really see like real estate as a hedge. The reason why people got killed in 2008 is mostly because they were over leveraged or leveraged the wrong way. There were plenty of investors who did fine. I had two that didn't do well, but that was, you know, leverage risk. And I still was OK because yeah. I had made good deals on the way in. Do you feel like people are freaking out now, you know, with the economy and mortgage rates? Like, hey, how's real estate going to work for me? I don't want to pay percent, you know, on all of this now. Yeah, that's exactly how you know real estate's not going to have that bad of a day. And I'm not saying real estate <laughs> won't have some negative effects because sure, there sure. are some hot markets, you know, like Tampa. I expect Tampa to start tanking, you know, anything on the West Coast in, in general is horrible. Heck, heck, anything in the Western half of the United States, like where I live. You know, I live in the Rocky Mountains. That's still not great. You know, so there's there's going to be that. But because so many people say they think real estate's going to tank, that usually means that it won't. Because whenever we see recessions, whenever we see market shifts, it's usually because the opposite happens, what we expect, right? Like if everybody thinks it's to the moon, you know, like we heard with crypto back, you know, just a year yeah, ago, yeah. it's to the moon, right? And then it crashes. You know, same thing happened. You know, it hasn't even happened yet with stocks. People still haven't talked about stocks tanking. They're just like, well, yeah, it should keep going up. That's how I know stocks are going to tank because it's always when the dumb money goes in, which is usually I mean, not always dumb, but the ignorant money, meaning that general population will put their money into that thing. And when the general population puts the money in, that's when it's about to crash. That's always a cycle that happens. Same thing with real estate. It happened before when even dumb money went into real estate and then it crashed. So, I actually think real estate's safer, and I think it's actually a great opportunity because so many people are afraid of it. That's why you should be in it. Whenever yeah. everybody else is running away, scared, that's where you should be running towards, as you hear like Buffett and Charlie Munger talk about, right? Yeah, I agree. And, and I, yeah, I think when I did in 2008, the only reason why I actually, I wouldn't have lost money on those properties if I could have held them, but I was moving states. So I kind of, I had to sell. But yeah. if I didn't have to sell, I would have already would have made a ton more money if I still had them now. So that's the thing. It's really like a timing thing. And I didn't have, you know, I didn't have any leverage. They were cash bought. So I was pretty like safe on that. Yeah. And that's and that's kind of where we we help our clients, you know, guide them in that sense, because, you know, they, of course, they want to believe it's true. But at the same time, they hear everything from the news and the media Half time, we just have to tell them to turn it off because whatever the media and the public is saying, it's usually going to do something different, right? And so, you know, like, for example, the one that's getting hurt the most right now are like doing long-term rentals, you know, where definitely having a higher interest rate is affecting the cash on cash returns. Now, we'll still have guys that we have, you know, now we don't ever raise capital. We always, we have a whole network of people. We have over like 20 different operators and companies we can refer to for different strategies. And so for turnkey providers, we got, you know, even right now, at least good three companies of like the six that have yeah. decent returns right now, even if it's only six or 7% cash on cash, that's yeah. still decent. That's good profit. Now, if it was like one, two, 3% cash and cash guaranteed, I'm, we're going to be saying that's probably not the option you want, right? Cause you need yeah. more profit than that when you have a rental. So a lot of our people, they're looking at some syndications. Oh, actually, it's funny that oil and gas has skyrocketed over 28% in the last three months because uh, we actually had an oil and gas syndication that was in our network that we've been talking about this for over a year, that oil prices are getting ready to skyrocket. But you know, when Biden opened up the whole reserves, you lower the prices. Well, now it's skyrocketing. They were already making some of them. I mean, the one I was in, 
you know, made, and here's, here's to describe what this investment's like. It's not just oil drilling speculation. You're actually renting your land. You own the land that you mm. rent or, you know, yeah, you rent it to the, uh, the oil companies because oil companies usually don't want to buy the land. They just want to drill on it for however many years they're going to be on it, yeah. pop, usually decades, and then do their thing. You know, that's all they want to do. They want to be a business, not a real estate investor. Well, we're the real estate investors that let them use the land. We'll charge them rent. It's almost like a triple net lease because you not only get rent, but you get the royalties from the yeah. drilling too. That That's like cell phone towers back in the day. I remember yeah. my dad told me we had some dump property and I'm like, what are you going to do? He used to just buy stuff at foreclosure. And I'm like, what are you doing? And then one day he said like, oh, well, this is like right when cell phones were getting started. They were still like the big, you know, brick kind. And he's like, no, they're putting a cell phone tower on. And I'm like, huh? He's like, yeah, it's going to make a lot of money. And it's just literally a garbage property, but it's a perfect place for a cell phone tower. So it's true. And pretty much if you have a self storage facility, you're going to have a cell phone tower to help get a little extra profit from there too, right? Yeah. So yeah, so like that thing, I mean, that's been paying great. I mean, I got paid about 8% the first year it was open, but I had other clients on a project just the next month that made 35%, you know? So there's a lot of opportunities there. Funds have definitely been one that we've been talking about more because they're more diversified versus a single yeah. syndication deal. Single syndicated deals, especially if it's an apartment space, whew, I mean, that's that's a rough one right now. I mean, even the best operators, the ones that have been you know, doing this for decades, Still, some of them have had some speed bumps here, you know, yeah. so you got to be careful there, but it doesn't mean that's not a good opportunity. It just may mean that you might have to wait six months, a year or longer before you really start to see some good, good deals come out. Self storage could be good, but again, they're having a similar issue as apartments right now. Um, like I mentioned, partnerships. I even have some clients that are looking at things like franchises, even though that's more active. If they, if they get into a franchise that they own. Yeah. Or, you know, syndicated franchise like a car wash where now you, you are passive, but you can make the profits a little bit more. Uh, I like franchises, bit. too. I, I look at them all the time. I just never really pull the trigger because like I, I just look at them and I'm like, oh, I'm really close. I've done like due diligence <laughs> or third level on a few of them. But then again, it, yeah, for me, it's like, well, how much do I have to be involved? Is that going to is the is the return going to be there for me and what I want to do, but I can see it working for a lot of people. But that's just good yeah. advice, because that's just diversity across uh, an investing cycle, which again, is kind of like the antithesis of what you were taught as a financial advisor, which is like, you know, stocks and bonds, whatever, just keep them in this funnel. Yeah, it's real diversification. Yeah. Do you feel so much freer as an advisor and investor by not being constrained by those, you know, the corporate drawstrings that hold you in? Absolutely. I mean, I realized pretty, you know, before I left the financial advising industry, I realized pretty late in the game, you know, pretty soon before I left, I realized I was just a salesman in a suit. Because the truth is that those licenses that you get as a financial advisor, they don't really make you a financial expert. They just give you a license to sell. That's really what it is. And you're really just selling mutual funds. And if you have an insurance license, you can sell insurances, including like annuities and things like that. Yeah. If you really look at what financial advisors recommend, it's all the same thing. And sure, there's a few random ones out there that might say, well, we'll do some things with like hedge funds or alternative type investments. But they really still believe in the myth that somehow this perspective of having a lot of the stocks and mutual funds and things like that as part of your portfolio is it. And, and by the way, when people tell me, well, I've got REITs, I got a real estate investment trust fund that I'm in. I'm like, you're not in real estate. That is a, that's like, a copy of a copy. You know, if you ever yeah, watched yeah. Multiplicity with Michael Keaton, you know, when he, <laughs> yeah. he cloned yeah. himself, but the yeah. clones decided to clone themselves. And then that yeah. guy was a total idiot. That's what a mutual fund and REITs are. They're just like a copy of the copy of the real thing. And they have their own prices, their own markets, independent of the actual assets that they buy. Not to mention, I mean, you've seen this with hedge funds like Open Door and places like this. They bought horrible properties, like 20% worst, worst idea on purpose. So did, so purpose. did Zillow. I mean, I don't, I was looking at it the whole time, you know, read, I look, I'd see another article come out about these eye buyers going crazy. And I'm like, telling my friend, like, this is dumb, right? Like, we all agree, like, this is idiotic, this isn't going to work. And then lo and behold, of course, it doesn't work. You know, but it, it's like, I don't know how anyone didn't thought that was going to work. There's, there's no reason to overpay for properties. What's the point? No. 
I mean, the only people I knew were happy about it were, of course, the real estate investors that you and I knew that were selling to those companies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're like, I didn't even think I was going to sell. Someone offered me 20 grand more. I was like, yeah, sure. But that's actually, that's a good point. I think like the smartest real estate investors, we'll see if you agree, know that everything is for sale. Like I'm yeah. ready to sell any of my properties, including the house I live in, if the offer's right. You know, and right. maybe my kids didn't love that. And I didn't love that growing up because that's exactly what my dad did. But he's like, we're just going to do it again. You know, we're going to do the same thing. We'll just do all the same thing. We'll build a basketball court, whatever you want. But like, this is how it works. We're going to live in the house right when you love it. We're going to sell it because somebody else is going to love it and pay us a lot Don't of money. Too attached. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I've kind of taken that in, but I also see it, you know, like as a parent, it's like, okay, if I'm going to trade out this house, got to make sure the next one, you know, their rooms are better when they were younger. You know, mm -hmm. so so it works that way. So so we talked about, you know, you you take your clients, you're going to take a, a long look at what they're spending. So how do you get them like started in investing the right way? Yeah, it's uh, I mean, the first thing is, of course, the education. Then second is introduction, right? Is we have them really go and talk to some of these people, that, you know, that I've I've even invested with or vetted people like that and then have them talk with them, ask them questions. The great thing is they can come back to us because they hire us for fee only, you know, so. They come back to us because they know that we're not on their payroll. We're not getting right. kickbacks and things like that. We're very independent. We're not investment advisors either. So, you know, we're going to give our opinion, but we're not going to say you should buy or sell or not buy this. Right. Yeah. But, you know, if someone says, hey, I met these people, I feel pretty good about it. It's like, great. All right. Did you do your due diligence? Do you do this and this? Yep. Yep. All right. Well, if you feel good about it, then then there you go. Go for it, you know, or whatever. But yeah. But that's that's kind of how we, we help them is like we help them connect them to deals. Because, again, if you try to do it on your own, this could take you like it took me years and years and years, really decades to create the the group that I have today. And you can do it yourself and you can find great people out there. Yeah. I'll just tell you, usually the best people I find are not good marketers. They're not exactly. the one you're going to see. Yeah. You know, often they, they may never even show up on a podcast like this. You know, they might mm -hmm. be just good operators doing their thing. They're putting their heads down. They're workhorses. They're the kind of people who say, you know, come heck or high water, right? I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure that my investors get paid. And those yeah. are the people I love. I love the people that have high integrity that are willing to give the shirts off their back if they have to, to make a deal work. Those are the people I like. The ones that, you know, come on, they, they get on 5 million podcasts, you know, myself excluded because I don't raise capital, but you know, <laughs> you see these guys raising capital and they can raise hundreds of millions of dollars. In many cases, not all, but in many cases, they end up becoming the Ponzi scheme later on. Yeah, they, they don't even have their own money in it. You know, I mean, that's, that's yeah. the telltale sign. How much, how much money are you investing in your own deal? If it's very limited or zero, or you're working on a bridge loan and uh, it's not that interesting to me. I want them to have more skin in the game than I do to make me feel comfortable in that syndication model. Exactly. Yeah. My best operators, a lot of them, I, I don't even put on my podcast because I don't want them on one. I don't want competition from the deals yeah. I want to invest in, you know, yeah, as well yeah. as my own clients, my VIP clients. But, but two is like, you know, I, they, they probably can't handle it. <laughs> the truth, yeah. you know, they, they like to raise capital, but you know, if you try to give them too much exposure, then it's just too much for them to handle. They have too much money coming at them, not enough deals, right? So yeah, m more calls from unvetted opportunities that is just a waste of time. You know, word of absolutely. mouth is the helpful. I'm going to deliver you like X investor. They know if you're delivering someone to them, like that's qualified investor who you vetted much easier, you know, and, and, you know, again, yeah, you could go on a podcast and you could get a bunch of calls and, and emails mm -hmm. about things for some of us. It's okay. But I mean, I don't answer my phone anyway, so it doesn't, <laughs> you can call me all you want. Never going to answer the phone. It's way too, yeah. way too much for me. So right now though, in today's market, we're recording this mid September, it's going to come out in mid to late October. Mm -hmm. What's like, if, if somebody comes to you, you know, they have some money in the bank now and they say like, what do you think the best investment out there is for a real estate asset? In your mind, like what, if you could just choose one asset right now, what would it be? Well, the first one I would say is the one that matches up best to your flavor of investing. You know, that's. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Because like I have my favorites, right? Like, for example, like the oil and gas deal versus and also even the raw land partnership I'm in. Those are my two favorites right now for mm. me. But I'll tell you, like from my experience working with thousands of people, they no, not everybody's like me. You know, not everybody has the same flavor, the same thing. Like I, I, if you would ask me that same question a couple of years ago, I would have said turnkey properties hand down because I mean, having those four rates of return is hard to beat in any kind of investment deal. Yeah. But the market's shifted. It's not that time right now. That's not that thing. And so, but even before when I, I would say those are my favorite investments, I had clients that say, oh, 
I don't want to deal with a property manager. I don't want to deal with anything like tenants, toys, yeah. and trash. Even somebody else deals with it. I don't even want to have to worry that I might have to worry about it. So just give me that syndication. Just give me that fund, right? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, so I'll, it's it's so that's the the roundabout answer of not answering your question, I guess. But no, it's yeah, true. it makes sense. Though. It's whatever the one that matches up best to your personality and your goals. You know, if you you want more cash flow, then go for the deals that have cash flow. That could be it could be a syndication, but Sometimes those syndications are more longer term. It may yeah. not be the right fit for you. You might be better off getting a rental. You might be better off doing lending. Lending is actually a great opportunity right now. If I were to say across the board where more of our investors like to be in, it's usually trying to lend their money, whether it's short term or longer, but short term, just so that they have that money back for potential yeah. future deals if the markets really crash and things get really frothy out there. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think lending is really smart for people sitting on a bunch of cash that's earning one or two percent and not doing a lot, you know, and it's yeah. not that hard to manage. You're backed by an asset. You're going to be a lien holder like you're you're pretty safe there. Awesome. So where are you located? You're in the in the Rocky Mountains. Yeah, I'm in Utah, but uh, we have people that we help nationwide. Yeah. So across the board, I mean, have you are there like markets in terms of like where you might be interested or you're just looking at it as, as a full demographic in the United States? You know, it, I think it's tough. A lot of investors come to you and like, you know, hey, I live in Los Angeles. I'm obviously not going to invest here. You know, are you helping people or advising them at all on markets across the country? Because it's interesting. Like we talked about a couple, you see market get hot and you're like, well, that's not for really, you know, for me, everybody is investing there. I got to look somewhere else. Yeah, that's the great thing about being a passive investor is you can't invest anywhere. Generally speaking, we're definitely seeing a lot more deals in the Southeast, sometimes the Midwest. Yeah, which I agree. It's been that way for years even. But I mean, like, give you an example. I had a, a client in California. He had, you know, you talked about like investors are willing to pretty much part with their 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 investments. He yeah. couldn't do it. His very first, you know, home that he purchased was a duplex. He had to hold on to it. And he had, he was making $200 a month, but he had 600000 of equity in it. Oh my God. So do the math. It's a 0.3% return on equity. And that's one of the places we find a lot of people's potential is yeah. if they are real estate investors saying, why do you still have this property? Well, it's cash flowing, but not really. And see his goal in his mind, he was so nearly focused on that, that saver mentality. Yeah, he was like, yeah. well, in six years, I'm going to pay off the loan and then I'll cash flow 2,400 a month. And I said, with 600,000 equity, that's still horrible. You know, and of course it's California, yeah, yeah. anything on the West coast stink. So I, it took a few years and, and luckily for him over that period of time, he then had 700,000 of equity. By that point, he finally decided to, to cash, cash in his chips, right? He did it. He went from 200 a month. And then he actually just emailed me last week saying, Hey, I'm now at 8,500 a month, bought a bunch of properties around Louisiana, which not my favorite market by any means, but yeah. he loved it. And, yeah. uh, and the fact is he's like, I finally get it now. I see what you're trying to teach me. Four years ago, now I'm seeing the fruit of it. Like, yes, thank you. That that's way better than 2,400 a month, and that would have been still two years down the road in the future. Yeah, right. Wow, awesome, great information, Chris. Is the best place for people to find you moneyripples.com? Yeah, moneyripples.com is great. You can also follow our podcast, the Money Ripples Podcast, wherever you consume podcasts. And yeah, across social, if you put in money ripples, you're gonna find Chris Miles out there. Yep. <laughs> YouTube, Instagram, all of them. Yeah, no, it's good. But I mean, that's why it's good to have a catchy name. You, you can still get the handles. Like if you just want it to be, you know, John Smith, it's going to be John Smith, one, two, six, seven, five, three, two. It's just not going to work out. Exactly. Awesome, man. Well, it was a pleasure to talk to you. And thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Same here, Jonathan. Such an honor. Yeah, I appreciate it. That was Chris Miles. I'm Jonathan Green. This was episode 78 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. We'll see you next week. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with me, Jonathan Green. And I just want to remind you, and this is always an uncomfortable part, I don't want you to think that I'm begging for you to like, subscribe, follow, do whatever you have to do for the podcast, leave a five-star review. But if you like the podcast and you think it adds value in the real estate investing sphere, then just do me a personal favor like the podcast, follow it, share it when you can with your friends, and be so kind as to write a five-star review if you believe it deserves a five-star review up against what else is out there. I would really appreciate it, and I hope you keep listening.